All right, welcome to our first pre-lab video of the semester for the Chem 1212 lab here at the Dahlonega campus at North Georgia. So every week we're going to have pre-lab videos up for all of our experiments that we're going to be doing throughout the semester, uh, just to give you guys hopefully kind of some, some extra ways of kind of hearing or seeing some of the information that those labs are going to be covering, uh, as well as kind of going over important procedural aspects or techniques that you might not be familiar with. Uh, the goal here is really just, like I said, kind of help you guys on things like pre-lab assignments, pre-lab quizzes, uh, so that when, before you come to lab, you just feel better prepared about what things are being covered and also what you're going to be doing, uh, which then hopefully will make the lab itself a little bit easier as we'll have kind of videos and images that will help you know exactly what you're going to be doing procedurally in the lab uh, to make all of those processes a little bit easier when you're going through them for the experiments. Uh, for this first week, we're going to be talking about the crystalline solid state. And this lab is going to be a little bit different because there, there isn't a particular experiment that we're doing with this. It's really more about talking about and looking at crystalline solids. Uh, and we understand you probably haven't seen this in lecture yet, which is why there's going to be a, a little bit of lecture material. It's going to feel a little bit more lecture-ish than kind of what our normal pre-lab videos uh, will typically be. Uh, so I do apologize a little bit for that, but uh, we do want to kind of at least introduce a lot of these kind of general terms and ideas uh, before we actually get into what we're going to be doing for the lab itself in terms of like what we're looking at and kind of what calculations and things like that we're going to be doing. So as a starting point for all of this, uh, when we're talking about crystalline solids, we're really focusing on, on solids in general. And so we want to be aware of kind of whatever our different solid types are that we can really uh, encounter. And there's two main types that you'll typically hear talked about. We have the crystalline solids that we're going to be talking mostly about today. And what makes something really a crystalline solid in particular is that it's very ordered and very structured. Uh, and so it has this very kind of organized repeating pattern that's occurring throughout the entire material. And these crystalline solids can be composed of a variety of different kind of particles or building blocks that are actually being ordered in these patterns. Uh, and so we can have solids that are made of just plain atoms, uh, which is kind of the first ones we'll go in depth looking at here a little in a little bit on really just metallic solids, probably the common, most common one we'll see there. Uh, we can have ionic solids, which is the other one we'll talk about a lot about today, where all of kind of our building blocks for our repetitive structures are just individual ions. Or we can have kind of molecules as our building blocks uh, for things like molecular solids. And sometimes maybe we can have atoms uh, that are more covalently bound together to make what's called covalent network solids that I'll, I'll mention again here in a minute uh, to kind of differentiate about types of crystalline solids. Now, if something's not a crystalline solid, the other possibility that we can have is that it's called what we call amorphous. And so for amorphous solids, uh, they don't have a long range kind of ordered structure. They might have kind of a small pocket where things are very organized for a small portion of the overall solid, but the whole solid does not have the same repetitive structure. Uh, and so as a result, it doesn't have kind of the same properties or visual kind of context clues that we would normally associate for crystalline solids. So we don't see like faces or kind of like reflecting very well typically off of amorphous solids. This is more like if you think of like a powder or something of that sort is usually what, what most people are going to see or think of when we talk about amorphous solids. Now, I mentioned there's types of crystalline solids as well. Uh, so here we have just kind of a, a quick listing of the, the four probably most common ones. Uh, and like I've already mentioned, we're mainly going to be focusing on ionic solids and metallic solids uh, for kind of today's purposes or our lab this week's purposes. <clears throat> Molecular solids and covalent network solids, they're really just not as common. Like covalent network solids don't really have tons and tons of examples, especially not ones we're going to see all the time in general chemistry. Uh, <clears throat> and in terms of what these are, they're really just uh, solids where you have individual atoms that are covalently bound to each other, but you don't have specific small molecules that are then held together. It's actually just covalent bonds that just kind of continue infinitely uh, linking all the atoms together. And so they're actually relatively strongly held together. And so property wise over here, we'll see uh, they have relatively high melting points. Uh, and so things like diamond and sand, silicon dioxide are examples uh, of covalent network solids. <clears throat> and then for molecular solids, these are the other ones we're not really gonna talk much about today. Uh, these are a little bit different because they're, they actually have individual small molecules as our building blocks as far as making kind of our organized structured patterns. But molecular solids also aren't all that common because as you see here, there's a bunch of examples listed, but none of these things are actually solids at room temperature. So most molecular solids, they're only held together by intermolecular forces, which are weaker than covalent bonds or ionic bonds. And as a result, uh, we end up with kind of these low melting point or often very soft compounds uh, that at room temperature are very often gases or even liquids instead of solids. Uh, and so 
<clears throat> not a lot of these that we're going to encounter unless we get really big molecules involved. Uh, and so as a result today, we're mainly going to focus on the two more common types of solids we're more likely to encounter, and also ones that just, I think, make it a lot easier to introduce kind of the general ideas and terminology uh, involving crystalline solids. So we're going to focus on ionic and metallic solids in particular, and we're really going to start with metallic solids uh, specifically, just because they are made up of basically just one pure element. And so you just have a bunch of atoms of the same element organized into some repetitive structure, uh, and it makes it, I think, the easiest one to start talking about terminology-wise. And then we'll look at kind of what things we can add to that in terms of what happens with ionic compounds. <clears throat> so for these metallic solids, uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about is how and what our structures for these things actually look like, how they come together. So the easiest way to go about picturing kind of solid formation is to really just think about all of your individual atoms or ions as just little spheres. And we're trying to kind of pack them together as tightly as we can. Now, in reality, not every kind of style of packing or every crystal structure type is going to be packed as tightly as it can possibly be. Uh, there are some variations, or I'm going to introduce those here in a second. Uh, but the easiest way, I think, to think about how these different packing styles or crystal structure types uh, differ from one another is that we're always making solids by kind of having one layer of atoms and then stacking a layer on top of it. And so things can be different based on what the individual layer structure is, or they can differ in how those layers stack. And so our four major types of crystal packing uh, that we're going to talk about for this lab, and also these will be the main four that will probably get talked about in your lectures, uh, are going to be simple cubic, body center cubic, uh, cubic closest pack, and hexagonal closest pack. So these first two, simple cubic and body center cubic, uh, these two are going to be very similar to each other. They have the same individual layer structure, but they differ in how the layers get stacked. And then cubic closest pack and hexagonal closest pack are going to follow kind of the same suit. Uh, cubic closest pack and hexagonal closest pack are going to have a different layer structure than the first two, but these two have the same individual layer structure, but again, the stacking of those layers is going to be different for those two structure types. So we're going to take a look at some kind of visual images here to hopefully help uh, differentiate and kind of get a feel for what these different structure types look like. So for a simple cubic packing style, you're going to see that an individual layer has kind of this grid-like kind of uh, form to it uh, as far as kind of how the atoms are arranged within an individual layer. And then each layer, as it gets stacked on top of the one before it, is directly on top. So you see basically like one atom is directly on top of the atom in the layer below it. Uh, and they're kind of like in, in what's often referred to as like an eclipsed format, uh, or should I said directly over the top of it. Uh, Body-centered cubic is, again, same layer structure. It's kind of this grid-like form. Uh, but the difference is that the, each, each kind of alternating layer is kind of offset now uh, to the point where the second layer, like in this case, like layer B, the green spheres in this image, uh, is actually sitting in the crevices of the first layer. And that actually will cause the individual layers to spread out a little bit. And it's going to affect what we call this coordination number that you kind of see listed down here. And this coordination number, we'll mention it again here in a little bit. Uh, but one of the things to keep in mind about coordination number, the bigger the coordination number is, likely the higher things like density or higher packing efficiency a particular solid is likely to have. Uh, because the higher that coordination number, really the more efficiently you're packing everything together, the more tightly you're packing all of your individual atoms or ions. Um, and so there's not going to be as much empty space, and it's likely to be more dense as a result. Now, our other two kind of layering styles uh, we can talk about are going to be hexagonal closest packed and cubic closest packed. So, we mentioned that these have a different individual layer structure. And so if we look here, kind of just like an individual layer, it has kind of almost like a honeycomb or hexagonal shape to it. Uh, where We have like one atom surrounded by six others around it in the same individual layer. And then the difference between these two in particular is how the individual layers stack. Uh, and so for hexagonal closest packed, uh, basically your third layer is exactly the same or kind of eclipsed or directly above where the first layer was. And you just have kind of a second layer in the middle that's a little bit offset. Now, the second layer in this image is only showing kind of three atoms here. But if we expanded this out a little bit more, you would actually see the full honeycomb type shape for that layer as well. Uh, and so it is like kind of the same layer structure for each of these. It's just they're offset from each other. Like that middle one is different than layers. Uh, no, in this case, layer B is different than layers A. <clears throat> if we look at the cubic closest pack, we actually get a third layer type. And so we basically like A, B, C. And again, the individual layers are all still going to be identical with this kind of honeycomb shape, but they're all just kind of rotated and twisted and offset a little bit. Uh, and so we have kind of this ABC, uh, basically packing arrangement or layering style, uh, as opposed to like an ABA, uh, which is what we see for the hexagonal. Uh, and so 
these, these two structure types end up very similar for a lot of their properties, like in terms of like the efficiency of their packing, they're actually identical. Like one is not really necessarily better than the other, but they are a little bit different. Uh, and they will actually lead to different what we call unit cells as we start breaking these things down into like what is the smallest kind of repetitive piece of this overall structure that we can look at. So on that note of kind of talking about unit cells, I do want to introduce some terminology that you are going to want to know for talking about solids and just crystalline structures in general. So the unit cell, you'll hear this term a lot when talking about solids, it's the smallest repeating block basically for your structure. We said that crystalline solids have this repetitive structure that's highly ordered. The unit cell is kind of the building block. Uh, and so it's basically the smallest repeating unit that you're going to have repeating over and over to make your overall solid. Now, there's a lot of different types of unit cells. Uh, for the purpose of this lab and also this class, we're mainly only focusing on the cubic cells. Uh, the lab does have one instance of a hexagonal unit cell. Uh, in fact, it'll actually show you an image with zinc. Uh, it'll be pretty easy to determine that that's the hexagonal crystal uh, unit. I'm sorry, the hexagonal unit cell in comparison to all of our other examples because it's the only one that's not shaped like a cube. Uh, and so it'll be pretty easy to pick out when you actually see that one and have to identify its unit cell type. <clears throat> now, as we talk about unit cells, uh, since we're going to mainly focus on the cubic ones, for any cube, there's what we call these lattice points, or kind of really the locations on the cube itself. Uh, where the atoms or the ions are actually going to be found. There's four main location types that we're going to encounter. Uh, and so we see here we have the corner, the edge, the face, and then what we call either the body or the center location uh, within that cube. And what you see there as far as kind of like the numbers and parentheses, the fractions and parentheses, that's how much of each of the atoms in those locations is actually inside the unit cell. And I think to help that, I'm going to show some images for each of these here in just a second. Uh, that will help make it a little easier to see why if something's at the corner of a cube why there's really only an eighth of the atom at that corner inside the cube itself. Uh, and again, this will be important uh, to know how much of the I atom or ion is inside the unit cell when we start trying to do calculations for things like density or packing efficiency. And then the last terminology piece, we've actually already touched on this a little bit. This is the idea of coordination number. This is really just the number of kind of neighboring atoms or ions that are touching the particular atom or ion that we're looking at. For metallic solids, it's actually fairly nice. There's just one coordination number for them. Uh, every atom basically in the metallic solid structure is going to be touching some number of atoms. And if you look at a different atom in the structure, it's going to be touching that same number of atoms. Uh, ions, or really ionic compounds in general, uh, are going to have two different coordination numbers. They're going to have one coordination number for all the cations. So all the cations should be touching the same number of anions. And then the anions also will have their own coordination number that can either be the same or different from what the cation coordination number is. Uh, and these actually aren't as bad as they sound in terms of actually figuring them out. You're really just looking at, all right, pick, and, pick your atom or your ion that you're looking at. How many of its neighbors is it actually in close contact with or is it going to actually be touching? Uh, we'll look at some images here that will help us with that as we go through some of these examples. Uh, first, though, just kind of highlighting those uh, locations within the unit cell. So uh, if we're talking about the body or we call it the center location, uh, we're basically talking about the actual just dead center of the cube. So this this particular atom or ion or the sphere, if we're looking at just like the, the shapes, is sitting in the dead center of this whole cube. And what's important to know is that basically this entire thing is inside that cube. So anything in a body or a center location like that adds a complete atom or ion to the number that are inside the unit cell, which is one of the things that we'll be trying to figure out for each of our unit cell types, uh, as well as each of the, the images of our different solids that we're going to be looking at today. Now, face locations. So the faces or here on our, our cube, we have six of them. If we think about how many cubes are actually meeting at the face, uh, if we're putting together lots of different cubes to make our overall solid from these unit cells, and there's two cubes that meet at every face. And so if we have basically one cube over here and then the cube that's actually shown and filled in here, we have this each atom that's on the face locations of these cubes is basically being split into two. Uh, which is why there's one half of an atom actually inside our particular unit cell that we're looking at for each atom in one of these what we call face locations. <clears throat> Likewise, we can have edge locations. Uh, only here, instead of the, our edges are not the meeting point of two cubes, but actually the meeting point of four cubes. Right. So if we're looking at this image, we have uh, basically the cube that we're looking at right here. We'd have one cube on this side, one cube kind of out in front towards us here on this side, and one out in front just directly in front of this face. So there'd be where well, there's four cubes all meeting along this one edge, which is why then there's only one fourth of an atom inside any one of those cubes uh, for those locations. 
And the last location type that we uh, mentioned before is the corner locations. So for the corner pieces, uh, all of these are going to have an eighth of an atom inside the unit cell. And that's because at every corner, there's actually eight cubes meeting at that corner uh, spot, basically. So if we think about like this corner right here, we have the cube that we're looking at. We'd have one cube kind of here, another one back a little bit, another one lower kind of in the back here. But then we'd also have four more cubes kind of on the top part above where the current cube is. Uh, and so we have eight total cubes meeting at that one point, which means there's only the, an eighth of that atom in any one cube or any one unit cell. <clears throat> now, some of the other kind of notation or terminology pieces, things that we're going to be kind of trying to identify from different structures as we look at them today, uh, is going to be figuring out how many atoms or ions are within a particular unit cell. So for figuring this part out, uh, metallic and atomic solids, there is only going to be just one Z that you're going to see listed in like your data tables for CSC pub. Uh, this is just the, that when you see that Z, it's just asking basically how many atoms or ions are inside that unit cell. For the metallic one, specifically how many atoms of that metal are inside the cell. For the ionic solids, there's actually going to be like a Z plus and a Z minus that are going to get asked for. And this Z plus is just going to be the number of cations inside the unit cell, and Z minus is the number of anions. Now, we want to be careful because you're not just looking for like how many spheres do I see because we just went over these different locations. Right? And so we might see eight spheres, like for all the corners of a cube, but that's not eight ions or atoms actually inside the cell. Since there's only an eighth of an atom for each corner that's inside the cube itself, all of the corners together are really only one atom inside the unit cell. And so when we're asked for like our Z or our Z plus or Z minus for metallic or ionic solids respectively, we want to be figuring out how many ions or how many atoms are actually inside the cell entirely. Uh, and so if we have one, you know, the same element or the same atom at all the corners, all together that's one atom inside the unit cell. Uh, coordination number, like I mentioned before, just how many of the nearest neighbors we're touching. Uh, our metallic and atomic solids are going to have just one coordination number, which is just the number of atoms, any given atom that we look at it, are touching in our structure. Our ionic compounds are going to have actually two coordination numbers. Um, and it's going to be each, each ion is going to have a, its own coordination number in terms of how many of the opposite ion it's touching. So for instance, like we're going to see labels of like CN plus or CN minus potentially in our data tables. Although I think most of our data tables only look for CN plus on a lot of our examples. Uh, and really CN plus would just be how many anions is each cation in the structure touching. Uh, CN minus would be how many cations uh, are each of the anions touching in the structure. Uh, and they all should be the same for as far as like a particular ion type. So all the cations in that structure should have the same coordination number. Likewise, all the anions in the structure will have the same coordination number for these crystalline solids. <clears throat> all right, now, <clears throat> most of our focus today, we mentioned kind of packing styles a little bit earlier. Most of our focus is actually going to be on the specific unit cells for each of these different packing styles. Uh, and so we're going to have three main unit cells that uh, types that we're going to be talking about. And these correlate to the crystal packing styles that we talked about earlier. So primitive cubic or simple cubic, like simple cubic we mentioned as the packing style before. Uh, simple cubic is then the unit cell as well. Every now and then you might hear primitive cubic used instead of simple cubic. Those two do mean the same. Uh, at this point in time, just about everybody uses simple cubic as far as kind of the terminology. People used to differentiate like simple cubic and primitive cubic to talk about the packing style versus the unit cell. And now it's kind of just, I think everyone's kind of defaulted to simple cubic as being the, the general description for both. Uh, but if we have the simple cubic crystal packing style, the result is getting a unit cell that is a simple cubic unit cell. Likewise, we had the body-centered cubic packing style that we talked about before. Well, if we have a body-centered cubic packing style, the unit cell is going to be what we call body-centered cubic. Uh, and then if for our cubic closest pack that we mentioned before as a packing style, we actually get our face-centered cubic unit cell. And the one that's not mentioned here that we had kind of introduced previously is hexagonal. Uh, we're not going to focus as much on the hexagonal unit cells because since they're not a cubic shape, they're just not as convenient or easy to talk about or work with. Now, <clears throat> for each of those unit cell types that we just had there, we're going to kind of go through and talk about like what their structures look like or kind of take a look here at their images. So for a simple cubic unit cell, really what this looks like is just having atoms on all of the corners of a cube, and that's it. So we have atoms on all of the corner locations. And remember, uh, in terms of how many atoms are actually inside the unit cell, which is one of the things we want to be able to identify for the structures we're going to look at, if there's atoms only on all of the corners, that means there should only be one total atom inside the cell. So all simple cubic unit cells will always have just one atom actually inside the cell 
for that particular element that's making up that simple cubic structure. Uh, the other thing we're going to see often given besides just uh, like the number of atoms in a unit cell, we'll often talk about edge length equations uh, because the edge lengths of these cubes are going to be important for doing calculations. Uh, we're not going to be able to calculate density or calculate packing efficiency, which are two of the common things we usually try to calculate when talking about structures, uh, unless we know the edge lengths of our different unit, uh, unit cell types. And so for simple cubic, since we have our atoms, and this is kind of shown basically to, kind of to the appropriate size of things, uh, our atoms in the corners are basically touching each other. So the whole edge length is really just two times the radius of the atoms that are making up the unit cell itself. And so that's what this equation is. Uh, you're going to see in your lab reading, you're going to have a whole table for all the different compounds or, metallic so or ionic solids or metallic solids uh, that we're going to be looking at specifically. That's going to give you the actual edge lengths. And for a lot of the metallic solids, you're going to be calculating what the radius then is for those particular atoms. Uh, for a lot of lecture problems, you might actually see it the other way around. You might be given like atomic radius for things and have to actually find things like density, which will require you to find the edge length using the radius. But either way, these equations do pop up frequently uh, in the calculations involving these solids. Uh, for the body-centered cubic unit cell, in terms of what's different about it, it's similar to the simple cubic. We still have atoms on all of the corners. Only now we've also added one single atom to that we call that body or center location. Uh, and so we basically now have one atom from all of those atoms in the corners, plus one additional atom from our one in the center is going to give us two full atoms inside the unit cell for everything that's body centered cubic. And here we see our edge length equations a little bit more involved because the geometry is a little bit more involved. Uh, the two atoms in the corners are no longer touching in the unit cell. But what is touching is basically a corner atom to the central atom, which is then touching one to that diagonal. And so we can do a little bit of kind of Pythagorean theorem and some geometry to figure out that from this top, you know, one top corner going down through the diagonal of the entire cube uh, is going to be equal to four times the radius of the atom making up our whole structure. <clears throat> and then, like I said, little Pythagorean theorem, we can figure out an actual edge length that's going to be four times that uh, radius of the atom divided by the square root of three. Um, we're not going to make people derive these equations. Uh, typically, even for the lecture, these equations will usually also be given as we need them. Uh, but we do want to make sure for a given structure, if we're going to do calculations that involve edge length, uh, if we're starting from radius or the other way around, if we have the edge length and need the radius, we want to make sure we use the appropriate equation for the appropriate, appropriate structure type because each structure type has its own different equation. <clears throat> face center cubic, our last unit cell type that we're going to talk about. Uh, is just kind of like it sounds. So face-centered, we have atoms still in all the corners. That's kind of the common theme for all of these cubic structures. Only now we also have atoms in all of the faces of that structure. And so remember, each atom on a face adds a half an atom inside the unit cell itself. And we have six total faces that are basically going to be filled with atoms. Uh, and so six times one half is three, plus the one atom from all of the corner locations means we're going to have four total atoms in the face-centered cubic unit cell. Uh, and that'll, again, always be the case. We'll always see four atoms in that unit cell. And again, we'll see we have a little bit different uh, equation for our edge length relating edge length to the radius of the atom making up the cell. Uh, and again, we're not going to go through the full derivation of that. Uh, anytime we need these equations, we're basically going to provide them. Uh, so we just kind of have them for our use. Now, ionic compounds, in terms of like all, all of these structures we've been looking at are basically for pure metals. Uh, and so if we talk about how ionic compounds are different, they, they have a lot of similarities, but the main thing with ionic compounds is they're going to have structures like we saw in those last few slides, but those structures are going to be for anions that are going to make up one of those kind of three basic uh, unit cells, like either uh, the face center cubic, the body center cubic, or the simple cubic. And then your cations, since your cations are usually much smaller ions, your cations, instead of kind of taking up the normal lattice structure spaces, uh, like as far as being like at a corner or an edge or a face uh, or something like that, they're going to fit into kind of little holes or gaps in the structure. Uh, and so we often talk about cations fitting into hole types for an ionic compound. So metallic solids, we're going to talk about like their structures are just like, you know, simple cubic, body center cubic, face center cubic, maybe in a really rare instant hexagonal, but we don't really do much of the hexagonal uh, for this lab or for really the lecture purposes. <clears throat> For ionic solids, you're going to have anions that make up either those same simple cubic, body center cubic, or face center structures, except now you're also going to have cations that fit into what we call these holes. Uh, and so we have three main hole types that cations usually fit into, and the hole type is really just determined by what the coordination number of the cation is in the structure. 
So when we look at an overall ionic structure, we just want to see, like, do we have a cation that's touching eight surrounding anions? And if it has a coordination number eight like that, we call that a cubic hole. For something like this, where a coordination number is six, we have an, uh, one cation surrounded by six larger anions, that'd be what we call an octahedral hole. And if our coordination number is four, that's then going to be a tetrahedral hole. And the nice thing is all of these are going to basically have the same general geometry. So if the coordination number is eight, your cation is going to be surrounded in something that kind of looks like this general shape. Same thing, octahedral hole, it's going to be surrounded by things in this exact octahedral type orientation. Tetrahedral hole, it's going to be a tetrahedral orientation of those anions surrounding that cation. Uh, and the bigger the coordination number is, like if we have a coordination number of eight here for a cubic hole, that's also the bigger just the hole itself typically is. So if we have a really big cation, it's likely to have these higher coordination numbers and go into like a cubic type hole, for instance. Uh, the, our smallest hole type for, that we're going to talk about that our cations can go into is what we call these tetrahedral holes, where they're going to have a coordination number of four. And so our, our goal as far as what we're going to be doing in the lab, uh, we're going to have structures of different ionic compounds, like visual images of them. And we just want to look at like what's the overall general lattice structure being made by the anions, which are always going to be usually like the bigger spheres uh, if they're not the same size. Uh, and then from that, what type of holes are all of the cations in? And that's kind of the description that we give for our ionic solids. <clears throat> all right, the last couple things here we're going to talk about uh, in terms of what things we want to be aware of or what things we're going to be calculating actually for this lab are packing efficiency and density. So packing efficiency, uh, it's really just the volume that's occupied by your atoms or ions in your solid divided by the total volume of really the unit cell itself that you're looking at. So taking the volume of all of the atoms or ions that are in this in the overall unit cell, dividing by the volume of the unit cell itself. And so for calculating this, uh, we're really only going to be doing this calculation for metallic or atomic crystals, uh, things that only have one element basically inside of them. We're not really going to do this for the ionic ones. Uh, we will look at density for ionic crystals. But for our metallic solids, all we're really going to be doing here is taking the number of this Z, uh, like as we kind of introduced previously, is just the number of atoms in the unit cell, times by that equation there is really just the volume of the sphere. Right? We said we kind of think of all of our atoms or ions as always just being spheres. So we're just going to take you know, the number of spheres that we basically have times the volume of those spheres divided by the total volume of the cube for our unit cell, and that's where this A cubed is coming from. A is the edge length of our cube. The volume of a cube is the edge length cubed. So once we have A, we can just cube that. Now, <clears throat> for units on this on this calculation, as long as the units of R and A that you're plugging in here are the same, it doesn't matter what units you use because they're going to cancel out. Um, packing efficiency should always have a value between 0 and 1 for your final answer. Uh, and again, like it doesn't have any specific units to it because our units should be canceled. So it doesn't really matter what volume or, uh, or uh, kind of just length units you're putting in as long as they're going to be the same at the end to be able to cancel out. Density we have to be a little bit more careful with. And so density, just kind of quick review, uh, sometimes you will see it represented, particularly from a physics standpoint, like it's represented with this kind of Greek letter rho. <clears throat> density is mass divided by volume, and you see here these are our common units. Grams per cubic centimeter are kind of the most common units we talk about for density. So calculating density for our different solids that we're going to be looking at, if it's just a metallic solid or an atomic crystal, it's basically our number of, again, atoms inside the unit cell times this is the molar mass, right? So the, the grams molar parentheses here, these are just the units basically for that molar mass of that particular uh, element making our solid. And then notice, if this is grams, we're gonna have moles in our units. Uh, density doesn't have moles anywhere in it, so we need to get rid of that. Uh, and Z is also really gonna have units of atoms. So it's really like atoms times grams over moles. So to get rid of those units, we do divide here by Avogadro's number. So this chunk right here is basically gonna give us the mass of all of the atoms inside of our unit cell. Uh, and this here, this is going to be, again, just A cubed. This is our edge length cubed, uh, going to give us the volume of our unit cell, like the previous example for packing efficiency. Uh, and again, here's Avogadro's number. That's what, again, this part here is. That's really just our conversion to make sure that when we're calculating mass, it's going to end up with units of grams. And so at the end of all this, grams divided by cubic centimeters, those are the units we want for density. So the, the biggest thing, actually, probably the most common mistake I see on density calculations is that when you're calculating this part, this A cubed, A itself for all the unit cell edge lengths given in the lab reading, and just to kind of show you real fast where those are, uh, if you look at the CSE pub uh, reading for the crystal lab, like scrolling way down at the bottom, uh, there's a couple tables. You'll see one table here that has a bunch of edge lengths in it. Those are what you can then use to calculate your uh, volumes for your unit cells. And there's also if you scroll down further, some ionic radii too that'll be used for the ionic radius ratios we'll talk about in just a moment.
<clears throat> All right. So the last thing I want to say kind of about our, our density here, uh, we kind of have these equations up here for calculating them. And for ionic crystals, the only thing that really changes is that instead of only having one element basically present, you have two types of ions, right? So we can basically take the number of our cations times its molar mass and then add to that the number of anions times its molar mass to get the total mass of everything inside of the cell. Um, it's kind of the only thing that really changes there for ionic compounds. Now, one thing to kind of keep in mind, and this helps a lot when you get to the end of these calculations for density, uh, and kind of keeps them, I think, simplified a little bit uh, to check to see if you have kind of the right answer, is that you should always get something probably in the ballpark of around 0.3 to maybe up to 25 on the high end for grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter. Remember, grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter are identical or interchangeable with each other. So if you're getting densities that are like 10,000, or if they're like 10 to the minus 7th or something, uh, those densities are not anywhere near this range. Nine times out of 10, it's a unit conversion issue here getting the volume. And so just do be very careful of that as you're going through it. Okay, so here to kind of wrap up the last bit that we want to go through is actually looking at all of this information we've been talking about for the last almost 30 minutes now. What are we using it for? How are we going to be expected to get that information from what we're doing in the lab? So when you come to lab this week uh, and you're kind of going through things, you're going to see like your data tables on CSE Pub if you print it out in advance uh, or if you just want to pull it up through CSE Pub while you're doing the lab is also fine. <clears throat> you're going to see data tables that look like this that you're basically going to be asked to fill out and your submissions for questions on CSE Pub are basically going to be filling in like these blanks, like giving the, the unit cell type for the element or the compound or the ionic compound that's listed. Uh, answering the, you know, filling in like what is the Z or the number of atoms in the unit cell, what's the coordination number for the atoms in that unit cell, and then calculating the packing efficiency and the density, uh, as well as the radius. So all three of these last parts are calculations. And so we're going to take a look at what does this entail. Uh, one other note I do want to make, I'm not going to show three-dimensional drawings of my own, but I, I just have images that are going to be similar to what you'll be looking at uh, in the lab itself. Uh, but for answering kind of all of these questions, you're going to have to have the starting image of the solid structure, uh, and you're going to just kind of be answering all of that information. And then three-dimensional drawing, you're going to do your best to try and recreate what things look like in three dimensions. Uh, all of your three-dimensional drawings for all of the different metals and ionic solids that we're doing and looking at uh, are all going to be in kind of like one image to be uploaded to CSE Pub. So if you want to draw like all the 3D drawings on a separate page, I highly encourage that just to make that process easier. Uh, likewise, uh, the calculations for like packing efficiency, density, radius of an atom, uh, CSE Pub is going to ask for a set of like sample calculations for what, what you're doing uh, to calculate those values. Uh, and so I have a set of those calculations also from kind of on a separate sheet of paper. Uh, and actually for I think each, each individual is going to have its own calculation. So have those calculations on a page that you're easily able to take like a picture of and be able to upload for those as well. Now, getting the information, before we can go through and answer like what is the unit cell type for polonium or how many atoms are in the unit cell, like we can really never know just by looking at the element. Like we have to know like or actually see the image of the unit cell itself. And so this is an example unit cell picture for polonium. And so looking at this picture, we want to think about of the different solid type uh, structure types we saw before for unit cells, which one does this match? Well, if we're looking at it, it looks like we just have atoms on all of the eight corners, and that's it. There's nothing else there. So this would match what we would consider the simple cubic unit cell. So for the unit cell description part in the data table, we're going to be the same simple cubic. And I think actually CC Pub is even multiple choice on those now, so you're selecting the correct uh, unit cell type, which should be simple cubic or primitive cubic. Uh, depending on which of those examples is listed since they, they are interchangeable and mean the same thing. Now, number of atoms inside the cell, the Z that's listed uh, for polonium, if it's a simple cubic unit cell, there's just atoms in all of the corners, but remember each atom in the corner only is one-eighth of an atom inside the unit cell, but with eight corners, all of these together are going to give us one full atom inside the unit cell, so Z is one. And again, that's always the case for simple cubic, regardless of whether it's polonium or any other metal that would have this uh, structure type. Coordination number. So for coordination number, and again, the image that's down here, this is also the same as basically what we saw right here. They're just kind of slightly different viewpoints as far as like how large the, the actual atoms or spheres are being displayed. So for this one, this is the, just the normal unit cell, atoms in all the corners of our cube. But to really see the coordination number of, me, of this atom right here, we actually have to figure out like, how many things is this touching. Well, it's clearly got lines connecting it to three other atoms. 
But to see its coordination number of six, we also have to think outside of just the one unit cell that we're looking at. And so we also would have another atom that's basically going to go directly above, one that's going kind of off to the left a little bit, and one that's kind of coming out towards us a little bit to the left. And so if we're counting these, it'd really be like one above and one below, one to the right and one left, one kind of back behind and one out in front. So there's six total things around that central atom in kind of an octahedral type shape, uh, which gives us that coordination number then of six. And it doesn't really matter which atom we pick in the structure, it'll always have a coordination number of six, as long as we can kind of take into account everything that's around the unit cell that we're looking at. All right, uh, calculation sides of things now. So even though I know it's the bottom one listed, I think that the easiest or the kind of first calculation we'll take a quick look at uh, is finding atomic radius of polonium given the edge length. So first off, this edge length, this value right here, this 0.336, uh, this is nanometers for the units right here. This 0.336 is given in the table in CSE pub uh, that we kind of showed earlier, kind of in the reading. It has all those uh, edge lengths for all the different unit cells that we're looking at in this lab. And so if we know the edge length, the A value, all you have to do is solve for R from this equation. And again, this equation is specific to simple cubic. So identifying the structure type is really probably the most important part of everything for this lab. Uh, and before you leave lab today, you want to make sure at the bare minimum you have all the structure types for all of the compounds or the ionic compounds or the metallic solids that you're looking at. Uh, because those structure types being correct is what's going to set up hopefully the math to be correct then on the calculations. So we know polonium is simple cubic. So for simple cubic, this is the edge length to radius kind of ratio relative to one another. Uh, and so now we can find the radius from this edge length, and that's where this 0.168 nanometers is coming from uh, for the radius of polonium. Now, the other calculations, a little bit longer. So for packing efficiency, packing efficiency, just remember in general, is your, your number of atoms inside the unit cell times 4 thirds pi r cubed, where r is your radius that we just found, and a is going to be then your edge length. Well, in our case, the edge length was two times the, the radius we for simple cubic. So in our case, one for the atoms inside the cell for simple cubic. This was the radius that we just found. The edge length was two times that radius. It's getting cubed here, right? Edge length cubed for the volume. The radius getting cubed again for the volume of our individual spheres. And when we calculate this, we're going to get a packing of efficiency of about 0 0.524. Now, what that actually means for polonium is that about 52.4% of the space inside the unit cell is being taken up by atoms, and the other remaining 47.6% would actually just be empty space. Uh, and so this kind of information is really helpful to have kind of at a, a higher level, uh, looking at kind of solids and trying to figure out like what things can we do to a solid to manipulate its properties. For instance, if we want it to be either more dense uh, or if we want it to just be more rigid, we're going to add things to basically the gaps or the holes in that structure. And I remember that's how kind of our ionic compounds work to a small extent. Uh, is that we're putting cations in the holes of anions to kind of fill things in better. Uh, and so pure metallic solids, simple cubic is actually the worst packing efficiency by a considerable, excuse me, by a considerable margin. Uh, and that's to be expected because of the way that things are kind of being stacked directly on top of each other. So it leaves really big gaps and crevices between everything. Uh, and in some cases that might actually be really useful because maybe you want to put things into those gaps and crevices. Uh, like if you want to add a different metal or a different element into those gaps and crevices, that might change how that particular metal reacts with something or changes some of its physical properties in terms of like its compressibility uh, or things like that. Like, right, like uh, steel, for those that don't know, is basically iron with carbon kind of uh, crammed into a lot of little gaps in its lattice structure. Uh, and it reinforces the iron to make it stronger. Uh, and so there's a lot of kind of useful things that can come out of knowing packing efficiency and kind of relative space you have to put other things, uh, which is uh, in terms of like a material design, which is why we're kind of trying to go over a lot of these introductory concepts here in the lab. All right, the last calculation then for polonium is going to take a look at finding its density. And so again, generic formula here for calculating density, number of atoms inside the unit cell times the molar mass of that unit cell in units of grams per mole divided by Avogadro's number. That's what our, our notation here is. Uh, and so we have simple cubic cell, so one atom in the cell we already set for polonium. Here's polonium's molar mass, about 209 grams per mole. Uh, and then we're dividing that by Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole, with the purpose here of getting all these units to cancel out to just grams on top. And then on the bottom here, we have our edge length in nanometers. But before we go and cube it to get our volume, 
to, to detect in our edge length cube, we do want to put this into centimeters. Remember, density we want in units of grams per cubic centimeter typically. So we are going to go ahead and do this unit conversion for centimeters to nanometers. So uh, once we've done that, we get our volume, take our mass divided by our volume, uh, we get a density of a chlorine of about 9.15 or so grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, and again, typical values for density, something anywhere between like 0.3 up to maybe 20, 25 on the high end of things. Some of our really heavy, dense metals, like in the middle of kind of the periodic table at the bottom, uh, might have densities up around 20 or even a little bit higher. Uh, most metals, probably maybe somewhere in kind of like the, the 5 or maybe 10 or 12 range. Uh, and then some of the ionic compounds can have a little more variability. They'll actually sometimes be lighter. Uh, some of our little, uh, very light metals, things like potassium or sodium, might actually have very small densities, even around 1 or maybe even less than 1 a couple instances. So remember that as kind of general range and expectations. Because if you've gone and count found your density, and if it's something like 10 million, you have a unit conversion issue likely somewhere that you want to go back and look at. But it's probably more likely it comes out really, really small because uh, people don't change this properly to centimeters and they move it to nanometers and this number ends up too big and the whole density is too small. Uh, that's kind of the common, most common mistake I think we see in these calculations. Uh, and so just make sure you have kind of the right units down here or things converted to centimeters before you cube it and make sure you have the atom count right uh, when putting things in. I think those are the two common mistakes I see in this calculation. <coughs> Excuse me. So for ionic solids, as far as what changes, uh, we change a little bit in terms of how we talk about the structure uh, for the ions. For the anions in the structure, uh, they're still going to be the same as what we would normally describe for unicell structure types. So when we see the actual unicell or see an image of the structure, uh, we want to identify what is the un general unicell type that we see. That's going to tell us what the structure of the anion is, or in the case of the sodium chloride example that we're going to look at in just a second, that's going to give us what the chloride or like basically orientation or structure is going to be. The cation structure is going to be the whole type that all those cations are in. Remember we had our three whole types, cubic, octahedral, tetrahedral, and really to find that, all we actually really want to find is the coordination number of the cation. The coordination number of the cation and the structure for the cation basically go together. You find, if Once you see what this is, that tells you the whole type that the cation should be in. Now, the other pieces here that you're going to be finding for your ionic solids, this R plus over R minus is something called a radius ratio. Uh, this radius ratio is simply just going to be the ionic radius of the cation divided by the ionic radius of the anion. And this ratio gives kind of a rough estimation for really what this coordination number is likely to be. The closer this ratio is to 1, the bigger this coordination number is going to get. Uh, and then the smaller uh, this radius ratio is, the smaller the coordination number is going to be as a result. Uh, Z plus and Z minus are the number of the cation and anion in the unit cell. And then again, the density calculation, which we'll walk through here in a second again, too, to remind people the, the general steps. <clears throat> All right, so here's the image of sodium chloride and what its structure looks like. Uh, so this is an image of its unit cell. And so we notice that on all of the corners, we see chloride ions. And we also see chloride ions on all of the faces of the cube as well. So this is a face-centered cubic unit cell for the chloride ions. And so when we talk about the general structure description, we'd say it's a face-centered cubic arrangement of chloride ions. And then for the cations, we want to figure out what's the whole type. And remember, for the whole type, we want to figure out how many chlorides is each sodium touching. And I think the easiest one to probably see this on is going to be the one in the dead center here. This center sodium, you can actually just see the lines on it. It's touching one, two, three, four, five, six, all of the chlorides on the faces of the cube. So if its coordination number is six, we're going to say that that sodium is in octahedral holes. Uh, the other pieces then, as far as our, our general description for what's going on here, uh, since it's an octahedral hole type, coordination number for the cation is six. Those two, like I said before, go together. And then kind of backing up to the Z plus and the Z minus as well uh, for kind of our other pieces, if we're looking at the structure, even though there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, I think 13 total uh, uh, chloride ions that are visible to us here, that's not the, act, or sorry, 14, not 13, uh, 14 ions that are visible for chloride, that doesn't mean there's 14 chlorides in the unit cell. Remember, for a face-centered cubic unit cell, you have all these eight corners, which all combined add up to one chloride ion in the cell. And then the faces all add a half each, and we have the six faces, so that's basically three more chlorides. So we have a grand total of four chlorides in our unit cell. So Z minus is usually going to be the easier one to find, because Z minus, once you know the structure type, that tells you basically the Z minus, just like how the structure type told you the Z for the plain metallic solids. 
The Z plus, there's a couple different ways to find Z plus. One is by looking at the structure and trying to figure out like how many of them are completely inside the unit cell, like all this, these sodiums on edges when they're contribute a fourth. Turns out there's 12 of them on edges, so 12 times a fourth is three, and then one in the dead center is a full one, gives us four. The other way that I think is even easier is just balance the formula. Sodium chloride's chemical formula is NaCl, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. If there's four chlorides inside the unit cell, there better be four uh, sodium ions to balance it out. Because if this is the repeating building block for the entire solid, it needs to be balanced for its charge. And so we should see four there for both of them. And again, radius ratio here, R plus over R minus. We're just looking really at the table uh, for the, uh, from the reading that has the, the radius of sodium plus and the radius of chloride minus, uh, or chlor chlorine minus one. And then we can figure out, right, what's that radius? Basically, just take the, the sodium radius divided by the chlorine radius. Uh, it's going to be something less than one, probably maybe somewhere in like the 0.6 or 7 range. Uh, that's going to be typical for what we see for a coordination number of six or these octahedral holes for the cation. Right. The last part for ionic compounds, uh, we don't have the exact calculation all drawn out, uh, but it's going to be looking at the density calculation. So to remind people on kind of the, the density calculation, just what it looks like for the ionic ones, we'll go back to the, just the generic formula here. And so for this generic formula, <clears throat> for ionic compounds, the only thing that's different in our density calculation is just that we have, we're taking into account all of the cations and the anions. Right, Z plus we just said was four for sodium. Z minus we said was four for chlorine. So we can take four times the molar mass of sodium plus four times the molar mass of chloride, divide all of that by Avogadro's number, uh, and that should give us our overall mass. And then we can divide by this volume to get our density at the end. Uh, and again, ionic compounds, you're gonna see a range of densities. Usually most of them are gonna have densities above one, but not necessarily by a lot. Uh, sodiums, I think if I remember right, it's somewhere like around two or so if you've done the calculation properly. Uh, just to give people an idea of kind of what you're looking for uh, on that one. Uh, last bits then to kind of wrap up and summarize everything. I know this has been a very long video, so I uh, apologize for kind of the, the length, but this is, like I said, one of the few labs that isn't really an experiment. It's a lot more kind of uh, lecture material kind of going on here. And so <clears throat> some things I want everyone to kind of keep in mind that before you leave the lab, the most important thing is that all of the structures your instructors are going to have you looking at you want to make sure you get the general structure description of everything. That's the most important thing, because all the calculations you can do outside of lab, uh, and calculations like density, uh, packing efficiency, uh, depend on those structure descriptions being correct in order for you to calculate them correctly and get the right answers for CSU pop. Now, on that note, though, I wouldn't necessarily put those calculations off till later. Uh, I would probably try to get most of those calculations done in lab. Uh, and take advantage of the fact you have faculty and TAs there uh, that are there to help answer questions and can kind of walk you through those calculations and make sure you're doing things properly before you leave. Because uh, this lab is really short enough that you can probably answer almost everything, even post-lab questions, before you even leave lab at the end of the hour. Uh, and so if you have questions, like, please, I, I, go ahead, ask your faculty members. Uh, that's what they're there for. We're there to kind of help to answer questions as people have them. Uh, this is a kind of a, like I said, a, a bit of a weird lab because it's not a real experiment that we're doing specifically. And it's also material that you haven't seen a lot, if at all, in lecture yet. Uh, and so we just want to kind of walk through and make sure you, you, everyone has kind of seen where the structure descriptions are coming from. And then make sure you're kind of comfortable in setting up the packing efficiency and density calculations, which once you've done a few of these, they're not that bad. They're pretty repetitive. Uh, and so once you do the first few kind of examples, then it does get a lot easier. But we want to make sure you kind of get those first few right so you kind of see how you're supposed to set things up and go about things. All right. Again, apologies that this week's uh, video is a little bit long, but thank you for following along, and I will see everybody then next week for the next video.